On our sort of updates recently around the FA, there's been a lot of changes in, in the FA sort of structure and then also along coach education and restructuring a number of courses. So I suppose my message is to keep a, keep an eye out um, on our social media pages and all our updates because there's a lot of changes and they're going to come quite quickly. So you may have seen the, the safeguarding courses out and live new. The first aid course will be going out very live soon. And then those who are working with coaches, which is most of you have already got your level ones, twos, B licenses, but the, the launch of the new level one, which is called the Intro Introduction to Coaching Football, will be going live very shortly as well. Um, so it's just to keep an eye on that. Obviously, level two and B licenses, they're still sort of being worked through. Um, and obviously, there is a little bit of a, a delay because of COVID, et cetera. But there is going to be a lot of stuff. The other big thing that we're going to try and do is a lot more CPD events over for the rest of this season. So we've got two more for this season up to June, July. But then also moving into next season, from sort of July all the way through to June. We, but we're also going to come out to you guys for your feedback and, and what you feel has worked. So do we do some online still? Do you want it all face to face? What days are going to be better? Evenings, venues, all those sorts of things. So probably in the next month or so, we're going to do a big consultation and it'd be really good um, for your feedback um, and thoughts on that. And that will help us shape the, what, we, what we feel that you guys want to get involved in really. So that's that bit. Um, obviously I have push record, so that's on now. And we'll share this with you and obviously other people. So if you've got colleagues, coaches, other people at the club and you feel this is really valuable, obviously you can share the link. They won't actually get the CPD hours, but obviously they can still benefit from the, the session. Hopefully all of you are used to Teams um, and no doubt someone will go on mute tonight and go to speak and someone will say you're on mute. Um, probably me. Um, but there's obviously a chat function. So if you use some of the, the options at the top, so we want you to engage with that. If you've got questions, you don't want to actually come on the mic or you, you want to type a question before you forget, use the chat function and we'll try and get to those as well. And then obviously, if you do want to ask a question live, happy for you to stick your hand up. So again, there's icons on more actions. If you stick your, your hand up, um, go like that. And then obviously we'll, we'll come to you as well. So just interact as much as you want throughout the evening. Turn your cameras on or off, happy with either. Um, and then we go from there, really. That's it for me, all the boring updates. So I'll hand over to the two masters. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for, for joining. Um, I think it was Mark that came on and said he's had a massive Sunday row, so hopefully you can just relax and, and take in, you know, the next hour. So really, <laughs> really quickly, um, you know, like we said, there, there aren't that many of us on tonight. So if you do want to keep your cameras on, Please, please do that, but just make sure you, your mics are off. And if you do want to ask something, just put your arm up or put your hand up or do use the chat box and submit any questions. Um, we are on till half eight, but if you've got anything that you want to talk about after 8.30, feel free to, to stay on. Um, what we're trying to do is just create that kind of coach education environment where, you know, when we are running courses, you know, we do hang around. And if people want to chat at the end about football, or about anything that you've got, whether it's towards the County FA or, or towards Vinnie and myself, feel free to do that. And then just really quickly, our session tonight, um, it's not COVID specific. Um, so please continue following government guidance, County FA guidance, your local leagues and your club guidance. Um, so just really quickly, um, we're the FA grassroots coach development team. So we've obviously got Dan and, and George from Cornwall County FA and then Got myself Vinny, um, my colleague Vinny, and myself who are going to deliver. Vinny, what do you do? Just just so the room knows. Yeah, thanks, Lars. Good evening, all. Good to see you, and uh, great to be along again for another Sunday night uh, session. Hopefully, those of you who've had a big roast dinner, uh, we'll keep you awake and uh, keep you engaged. As you can see on the screen, my role is specific to uh, physical education. Uh, so as a PE officer, it's to support teachers and trainee teachers within the universities. Uh, but we also work with the professional clubs within their community organisations. Uh, we work with 110 clubs all across the country. But obviously myself, Lars and Martin Dighton, who we'll introduce uh, on the slide later on. We've got a specific remit for the South West. Uh, so some of you met, we may have met already, but looking forward to getting going into our topic tonight. Thanks, Lars.
Brilliant. And um, my role's in diversity and inclusion. So my role's really to support coaches from ethnically diverse backgrounds um, and really trying to get them into coaching and giving them a first step, whether it be into employment or, you know, serving the community. So tonight's session on mastering the basics, um, really looking at foundation phase five to 11. Um, so I'm just going to kick us off um, with a slide. Um, Love is a better teacher than a sense of duty. Um, and quite a clever guy that's come up with that one. Vinny, what, what, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I think two really simple things for me, Loz. Um, we're all involved in, in what we do because we love the game. And I think our responsibility, particularly in working with children, but also as we work through into those teenage years, uh, as I did in my career as a, a PE teacher, uh, and also beyond with the adults, is to pass on that love of the game to them, to help them to fall in love with the game, um, to help them to stay involved for life, as all of us here on the screen so far have been fortunate to do so. Um, and that falling in love with the game is actually about the, the joy of scoring goals, but also the joy uh, and delight of stopping goals, whether it be as a goalkeeper or as a defender. So we'll delve more into what skillful playing looks like uh, but for me, it's uh, it's got to be all around that love of the game, Loz. Brilliant. And that's, you know, that's what, what we're all here for. And that kind of takes us to our aims. Um, so this is what we're trying to do in our next kind of strategy around developing, like like Vinny just said, around skillful players. The, the key bit here is around transformational coaches. And if we can transform the coaching that we do, it's going to provide exceptional and inspirational experiences for the kids that are coming through at, at 5 to 11. And for me, it's that real vital age that we get kids to fall in love with, with any sport or in, in our terms, it's making sure that whether they continue playing football for the rest of their lives, that's great. Or it might be they become referees, they become coaches, they become administrators, but they've got that love of the game. And, you know, even when they're 60, they're going to go and play walking football. Um, so we've just got a quick task and we just want to make sure people can use their chat boxes. Um, so what does a skillful player mean to you? So it means something to me. Uh, Vinny will have an opinion, but we just want to know what it means to everyone else on the call. So throw it into the chat box and, you know, hopefully we can get some content from you guys and we can just get some dialogue from what you say. Vinny, what's a skillful player to you? As, as it's coming in, have a think. Yeah, I'm just uh, seeing a few people typing away their laws. Maybe uh, we'll pick up on somebody's uh, thoughts. Here we go. So uh, thanks, Giles. Um, having the confidence to try things. Really like that. So straight away, we've moved away from the, the tech corner and we've gone into the site corner. Um, what's Charlotte saying? Someone who adds their own flair to basic football skills. That's individuality. And Gareth is talking about controlling the ball and mastering it for different situations. So just um, pick it up on a couple of things there, Loz. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if as the chat keeps coming in, another one there from Colin, um, it's people are very much zoning in on that in possession element. So when we talk about skillful players, if we'd have actually asked the, the group this morning, um, so I can see Martin there on the screen, if we'd have asked people to name your favorite player, uh, from whatever era, I, I think most people would actually go down the line of identifying that skillful player on the ball, so that in possession piece, so that individual skill, the ability to uh, take defenders on. Uh, but for me, uh, being skillful is the out of possession stuff as well. So goalkeepers are very, very skillful in terms of what they do. You know, typically it's been in terms of uh, saving shots, taking crosses. But as the game has developed the way it has in the last 10, 15 years, it's also the goalkeepers being very skillful for their feet. If we saw the Man City goal last week, then obviously that came from the back, didn't it, with a fantastic bit of distribution uh, from the keeper. Um, and I think, as was mentioned in the first bit there, we're not just talking about technical and tactical skill. It's also that psychological skill and those social skills, which were really important to me as a PE teacher. Uh, anything from you, Lars, that you've picked up in the chat or that you'd like to build on there? Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at Harvey. So even in Harvey, you're, you're a bit around confidence and communication, but then the bit around reading the game. 
So when we talk about skillful defenders, it's the ones that not necessarily the ones that run in and try and tackle and win the ball straight away. Um, are we developing defenders who actually can read it and, and look at intercepting? So um, one of the things that I was, you know, when you work with your players, is it rather than giving that, that player a challenge to go, right, go and win the ball back 10 times in this period, it's actually, can you try and intercept the ball five times? So then that kind of development is, right, they've got to be a really good communicator here because it might be telling his or her teammates to move into different areas and then actually taking a step back and, you know, intercepting the ball and then what does, what does he or she do after that? So I really like that one from Harvey. Um, and essentially all these kind of all blend into each other. So essentially what if you put everyone's comments into a box, it's essentially the four corner model around that holistic development. So whether they can dribble with the ball or pass the ball or being confident and brave on the ball. So us as coaches we can develop situations where they can go and really develop that. We're really helping these players become to become those next skillful players in the next generation or two. And um, just moving on really quickly. If my mouse works. Um, so these are our key priorities. Um, you know, the relationship between the two. So developing the child. That, that's important, but at the same time, that sport, physical activity and the game of football. So, Vinny, what, what, what does that mean? What, what are those hexagons saying to you? Yeah, I think, uh, guys, I've got to put my former PE hat on here um, because when we're talking about the development child, for me, we're talking about that golden age of learning, which is very much from three, four, five years of age. As I say, my experience was in the secondary domain, secondary schools, but I did a lot of work with primary schools. So if we just pick it up from five years of age, which is maybe more typically when the youngsters will also get involved with grassroots sport and grassroots footy. So that developing child of five years of age and then the sport, physical activity in the game of football. Um, I'm going to use the concept laws of PE. Uh, and guys on the screen for me, I, I could set you a challenge now. If you wanted to go back to your PE days, could you give me two words that the letters PE could stand for. And as you may be doing that and thinking, I'm going to share with you, for me, the most important thing is that it's positive experiences. And every single child from that five to 16 years of age has to go to school. Every single child will have access to PE lessons and therefore those experiences have got to be positive. So PE could be positive experiences. And laws, we can translate that to the grassroots game of football. The other PE for me, guys, just, you know, these are a couple of things I like to hang my hat on, is giving the children opportunity to play and explore. Like many of you, I'm also a grassroots coach. I've got the pleasure of working with an under 12 group here in North Oxfordshire. Don't be fooled by the accent. I emigrated a few years ago. Um, and in being in North Oxfordshire, uh, we've got one child, he plays footy. And it's really important in that one hour, hour and 15 minutes that we have with them per week to practice, that they have the chance to play and explore. So that for me, Loz, is the relationship between the two, the positive experiences and the chance to play and explore. And there's a couple of things coming in there in the chat box, Loz, around that PE idea. Brilliant. And I, I love that personal enjoyment and that, that foundation phase age. It's, it's all about them. And if you can ensure that your sessions gives that child personal enjoyment, they're going to want to come back. And then I love Giles', Giles bit around positive experience. So how are you going to now create that? You might be already doing it already. So, you know, it sounds like we're already pre preaching to the converted. So, yeah, really good, good comments. And, you know, keep, keep those coming in. Um, so really quickly around that foundation phase child. Um, so it is that that humans have got the longest period of childhood and then it, or the primate. And it's really interesting that it's been influenced over the years um, by evolution. But really importantly, it's that bit at the bottom that childhood is that time for exploration, experimentation and play. So if you look at play and it's just that, why, why have we highlighted that, Vinny? And why is that so important at foundation phase? I think simply that's where the learning takes place. So if we go into, I remember when I first got into coaching and the, the philosophy was very much about command style. 
And of course, if you're operating command style, don't get me wrong, there's a time and place for command style. Um, but if you don't give the children an opportunity to play and explore, then you never know what they're capable of. And I think that's really important. And I'll bridge that across later on, maybe to match days as well. You know, everyone here on the call, um, I think we're all challenged when we take it from practice session to match day. If we've got a certain philosophy around play, explore and positive experience for, for practice sessions, can we keep that same philosophy when we move into match days? Maybe once we've hit that under 12 age group where there's league tables being published and score lines being published. So, yeah, they've got to have a chance to play, mate. They've got to have a chance to, to try things out. Yeah. And I, I, I think if I asked everyone on the call, like, who loves playing? Um, I don't think play ever leaves us. Um, so I run a, a just play session for a group of dads in, in, in Berkshire. And when we turn up, we just want to play. And it just brings us back to the memories of when we were at school. Uh, you know, when you finish school, you turn up to a field and it's on the way home and we, we just want to play. And essentially, when the kids come to your sessions in that hour, it's that hour of do they want that structure or do they want that kind of freedom to just go and express themselves? And if you link it back to the things that you've spoke about in the chat, how are you now going to blend the two together? And we're going to try and explore some of that as, as we go on. Um, so really, really looking at kind of what we do ourselves. So if we just move into this slide here, um, so this was the, you know, this is four years ago when the under 17s won the World Cup. Now, if you look at some of those players, I don't know if you can see them on the screen, but there's some that are probably emerging in the Premier League that have had a really good season that are probably going to go into the Euros, some of those on that picture. Um, Vinny, why have we highlighted the, these certain colours why have we put the, certain, these, these words in certain colours? Well, as you know, I know the answer. So therefore, I'm going to bounce it to the punters. Guys, over to you again. Come on, have a look at those uh, words in red font. And what jumps out to you in terms of those different words? We're talking about skillful players and you can't be any more skillful at 17 years of age, can you, than winning the World Cup? And obviously, we're hoping that some of those individuals can help England to go on and win a World Cup at senior level. We're hoping it happens with the, the women's team, with our disability team. Um, but what is it about those different words that maybe takes the concept of skill uh, in a, a variety of directions? I'm just going to leave it there. So thanks, Dan. You've got us going uh, in terms of thinking and thoughts. So the, the cognitive side, the psychological side of the game. Uh, Charlotte highlighting that they're all positive features. Absolutely. Um, sorry, my apologies. It, it's not Mandy, is it? It's um, whoever Mandy's uh, real name is. Just talked about uh, learning. I knew I'd forget. <laughs> I should have run it down. Um, uh, Barry, great stuff. So... Yeah, guys, you, you're moving into the, the, the realms there of recognising. So there's this stuff in there about learning, which, again, we could say psychological, also social. I think if you really start to zone in, when we're looking at cleverness and courage and confidence, there's a lot of stuff there in the psychological corner. Uh, creating angles, that's not an individual thing. Yeah, that's got to be done as a team, working your way right the way up the pitch. So lots in simple terms now that we've had a little bit coming in from the chat. Uh, and actually Charlotte actually nailed it there, players about the team as a whole. Um, it's the four corner model. The four corner model for me is so important. Uh, if we really believe in the person before the player, we can't just be interested in how good they are technically and tactically. It's got to be about those psych skills, that creativity, that courage under pressure, which certainly this team was. And also that team ethic in terms of communication, cooperation, collaboration, uh, as a few buzzwords. Any thoughts from you, Loz, in terms of uh, building on that, in terms of that amazing achievement in 2017? Yeah, and I think if you look at you know, how football is and how we want players to, to play, I think a lot of these things are coming out now. Um, I think it goes back to when we were taught, um, you know, when I was taught, playing football growing up, it was kind of a if in doubt, kick it out era. So when even as a defender, it was kind of just kick it as far as you can. And if you're under pressure, just kick it out. Um, the phases of play the way you're facing or pass it back. 
you know, for us to, to allow kids to be creative and give them confidence is actually, can you try and take that player on? And I remember watching this, um, you know, four years ago, and it was so exciting watching these players play. Um, and if you, I don't know if you can see Foden there, he's, he's, I think he's one right near the trophy. Um, if you look at him playing, he's exciting. He, he probably still does that now. And he's probably, you know, if you look at how he's done this year, it, it, it's probably all those things in there. So it's about us not necessarily, you know, having this in, in two years' time. It's actually, this is kind of a long-term thing for your players. So you might work with your players for the next, you know, five to ten years. It's, you know, are they doing these types of things when, when they finish with you? Um, so just just really quickly then. So we, we spoke about Foden quite quite briefly and maybe Lucy Bronze as well. So when she gets on that ball, she, she really drives on it, but she's really comfortable at staying on the ball. So... Just as a little task to everyone who's on the call, um, what does staying on the ball mean to you? So in the chat box, a couple of words. It could be single words. It could be a, a statement. But when someone says, I want your players to stay on the ball, what does that mean? Um, what does it mean to your players? Or if you're asking your players, what, what does it mean to them? Yeah, and I'll jump in here, Loz, if that's OK. Um, yeah. I haven't had the, I, I've given the guys on the call tonight a, a bit of a flavour of, of my background. Um, so 30 years in coaching, uh, but actually it's only been the last five years for me that I've been working with that seven to currently 12 uh, year olds. So it's been a fantastic learning opportunity for me. Absolutely loved it. And the staying on the ball piece uh, for me has been giving those youngsters an opportunity again with that golden age of learning. Um, to within practice sessions, when we talk about small sided games, you know, under eights, the, the match day experience is 5v5. And therefore, for me, it's so important that we actually, if we believe in the value of small sided games, practice sessions, therefore, have got to be 1v1, 2v2, 2v3, because that small sided version of 5v5, if that makes sense. And sometimes people scratch their head when I, I, I say that, but if when we're working with older players, we believe that we're not going to put them into 11 v 11 every time we practice. We want them to have more contact on the ball, more decision making. Therefore, for our little ones, that's got to be your 1 v 1s, your 2 v 1s, your 2 v 2s. And that gives them loads more opportunity to stay on the ball and to work things out. What have we got, Lars? What's coming in? Yeah, so I think a lot of people talk about possession. Um, so keeping it, working as a team. Uh, control, being confident. I think that's really key. We, we talked about that holistic development, looking to play forward, uh, to protect the ball. I think that's a real key term that we need to tell our kids about protection. Uh, Dan talks about running with the ball, enjoying the ball. You know, are the kids frightened when the when the ball comes to them? Um, and trying to escape pressure. So you know, some really good points. Uh, Vinny, what what about you? What does it mean to you? Yeah, it's absolutely, it's it's an individual moment in the game for me, Loz. Yeah. Uh, with the youngsters that, that I've been working with within this age phase, um, we always talk about the words I use, and I'll actually type it in because it sounds a bit silly again, but it helps the youngsters to understand it. So I've always, I like to have a bit of play on words, Loz, you know that. But guys, I've just put it in there. Can you see it? Three menders. Yeah. Uh, and it sounds a bit silly, but the youngsters have understood very quickly that actually we're playing on the word tremendous. We want your play, your performance to be tremendous as individuals. So I always work on the number three. And so any player receiving the ball, can you actually make a decision within three seconds? Now, in their heads, three seconds is one, two, three. And of course, we know it's actually a bit longer than that. So they got more time than they realised. But of course, the only way they can actually um, make a good decision or explore what the various decisions are is actually by playing at the head up. And that might be a case of if they're facing the play, scanning the pitch from side, centre side, or if they've got the back to the play, checking shoulders, etc., which are two different things, scanning and checking shoulders, in my opinion. But essentially, I, I encourage them to try and make a decision within three seconds. And then we build on that. That decision isn't pass it after three or pass it within three touches. I see a lot of this within 
uh, junior football, that pass, 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 pass. You've got to give them the opportunity once they've made that decision within three seconds. We then say, okay, you've probably got three options. One of them might be to run with the ball. One of them, if defenders are close, might be to dribble. And another one might be to combine and connect, which is the passing bit. So you want twos, et cetera, or you pass and overlap. Uh, so they're the sort of messages really framed around the number three laws. Brilliant. I love that. I think I've known you for six years and that's another one that I'm going to steal. Um, that's fantastic. And essentially, this is what, you know, what, what when we were planning this, what, what we thought it was. And it kind of links to what everyone says already. Um, the, the key one that jumps out for me is, is like, you know, linking to, to, to Vinny's tremendous is looking at more attacking options rather than just trying to play it backwards or sideways. So are you going to combine? Are you going to keep it? Um, and it's just thinking, right, what are you allowing your kids to do that? Um, what's that around turning away from pressure, Vinny? I'm just going to throw that one at you. What do Again, you mean by that? it links back to that awareness, laws of, um, you know, if you're, if you're scanning or checking shoulders, just understanding what the, what the pressure looks like and where the spaces are. Uh, I think that's it's as simple as that for me. And again, it's really important that we, you know, the what the bullet points underneath taking someone on one v one. We can't expect our children to do that on a Saturday or a Sunday in match days if we don't put them into those situations during practice sessions. And even I dare say, uh, and I won't go into detail what my arrival activity was before our match day yesterday, but they're very similar to what I do on practice sessions in terms of building that learning and understanding. Uh, I saw, uh, I will mention something guys, just for the sake of it. Uh, I see so many line drills on a match day and we're talking under 12s, you know, so you, you're playing 99, so you maybe got 12 in your squad and I can see two lines of six in the other half of the pitch waiting to do a, a pass into the coach and then a shot at goal. Um, so th that turn away from pressure, dealing with the 1v1, but also having that awareness of what that looks and feels like from practice sessions to match day. And that, that bit at the bottom where it's in no priority order, it, it depends on the moment. And that's really important that your your players understand that. So it's not kind of a, you know, the first thing, keep possession, and then you move to the next one. The next one, it depends on what's in front of the player. And it's really important they, they make that decision, not you as a coach. Because what tends to happen is we see coaches telling the players what to do when they get it. So for you, it's, you know, if these are your, if this is your mantra and the players know like, what, what staying on the ball means to you, give them the, the freedom to go and do what they want when, when they are in possession of the ball. Um, why have we got that on there, Vinny? Why, why is it important that we, we understand what it isn't as well? Yeah, I think there's um, the being greedy bit. It, it becomes a real issue, doesn't it? And a bit of a... A challenge for us as coaches when we want our youngsters to be comfortable on the ball we want them to be composed i think it was just scrolling up there i really liked um rich lewis rich has talked about actually being brave enough to try and escape the pressure and even before that brett was talking about being composed so we want to develop all of that um but what we're not necessarily looking for is for young players to actually take on two, three, four, five, six defenders. Now, of course, if a youngster does that and it ends up in the top corner, you can't argue that that was absolutely fabulous play. Uh, but most of the time, any young player will reach a limit, won't they? They might take two on, but they'll get tackled by the third one. So it's that awareness of uh, the phrase I really like, Loz, is actually lending the ball. Yeah. So, you know, if you and I are playing... I've got control of the ball. I might go past one first defender, but then I've got to have that awareness again with the head up. Uh, I, I talk about playing like a meerkat because it makes the game simples. Yeah. Just looking for a few chuckles on the screen there. No, <laughs> nobody's having that one. Every um, time I still chuckle. But, but in all seriousness, it does play with your head up and therefore I might lend the ball to you and it might just be for the one-two. Uh, it might be for some sort of other type of combination play. So... Uh, lending the ball is, is an idea that the, the youngsters, uh, I think, enjoy because they know they're going to get back. Brilliant. Um, I just want to pick up a point that, that Rich talks about. So I'm going to throw this one to you, Vinny. You're, you're, um, Oliver's probably at this, this age. So if you watch kids play without pressure, such as at the park, 
they show incredible moments of skill. Um, and the trick is how, how as a coach, do I get them to do that in my session? So I know you do a lot do of a stuff lot of down at the park with, with Oliver. How do you blend that into your sessions? I know you, you coach Oliver as well and his mates. Yeah, um, I think two things for me. Martin isn't on the call, guys. Many of you will know Martin Dighton because uh, he, he's local to your region. Uh, and I know that Martin's done a, a lot of work in grassroots where when he's been mentoring coaches, he's encouraged the coaches to have a third half. And essentially the third half is the game, the formal game is finished. Give them another 20 minutes to play. And adults, we're going to move further away than maybe the respect line. And we're going to let them play. And Martin talks about the wonderful uh, moments like what Rich is referencing there in terms of the children actually just being more relaxed. Yeah, because they're not getting any even perceived pressure from the coaches uh, and certainly no pressure from parents who still have a tendency. You know, it's for us to control um, or to manage to actually try and instruct from the sideline. Um, so, Gareth, yeah, I can see uh, Daniel up there. So, Gareth shared the meerkat idea. So, yeah, sharing is caring. Gareth, go for it if you find it useful. Um, and I also really like what Daniel's put in there in terms of asking the players, what do they see? Um, so, Pete Sturgis, who many of you will know, has done fabulous work within the, uh, the foundation phase, um, talks about uh, helping the children to look in a certain place but not telling them what to see. Okay, so for them to consider, you know, what options they might have, but obviously not telling them what those options are. So the, the, there's so much in there to unpick, Lars, but I think for me that the whole uh, idea of lending the ball um, and being comfortable with the the, way, the decisions that the youngsters make, and my match day behaviour, by the way, just as a bit of a PS, is I take a camping chair, and I actually sit in my camping chair and sit and enjoy the game. And I spend most of my time talking to my rolling subs. Uh, yes, they had five of them. I missed a load of action on the pitch because I was constantly doing one-to-one -one little challenges with my rolling subs who were rolling off on and off every 10 minutes. So, you know, let them play. Yeah. And I think it's that informal environment. Um, just, you know, kids enjoy that inform informal environment where, it isn't pressure. There's no pressure on them. They just turn up and they have a good time. And if you can recreate that, not just in training, but then if you can, you know, lend that into your, your match day, then you know your, your kids are going to want to come back, and that's what we want. So, Jenny, over to you. Yeah, thanks, mate. So, guys, uh, from me to you. Uh, so this one is again into the chat box. Uh, we can clearly see uh, two young players here having a tussle. Um, so we have a, a favourite uh, little mantra within PE, within the PE team, of stars and wishes. So the, the youngster in the blue, uh, in terms of stars, what do you think he's doing well? Anything in the chat box? So we know that's not VT. It'd be better if that was live VT. Uh, but it's a still, but either way, uh, he looks as if he's in possession of the ball. He's under severe pressure. What would you say he's doing well? So what have we got, Lars? What's uh, what's flying in? Yeah, so we've got... Oh, you're too quick. Um, guarding the ball, shielding the ball, uh, low knee, knees bent, balance, protecting the ball from Charlotte, shielding, okay. protecting the ball. Uh, Harvey talks about low centre of gravity in the defender. Yeah, good one uh, there. Good breath. Good body uh, shape. Body shape, yeah. Yeah, firm foundations from from Mark. Right, guys, thank you. Uh, great input there. Everything in the technical corner. Every single thing in well, the technical uh, corner. Charlotte talks about focus and awareness. Oh, well, so well done, Charlotte. Well done. Just 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 came in with that one. Yeah. So it, it's just that realization again that. Um, yeah, it, we're definitely talking about technical ability that then becomes a skill when it's under pressure. Um, but we've also got to be aware of those other elements. So, of course, there will be a physical element in there. So we could have talked actually about strength. I talk about that arm there being long and strong. Yeah. And you could actually, if we were looking for an even better if a wish, then the, the, the little fella in the blue might just want to use that arm a bit firmer. Um, and... 
I think the other side, the psychological side, which we're going to move on to in a minute in terms of skill development, look at the youngster's head. So Mark saying eyes on the balls are positive. Love that, Mark. But I would say if we're actually looking there to say, OK, what might be improved? Yeah, the eyes on the ball might be a temporary thing, but that head's got to come up at some point, hasn't it? That head's got to come up. And if we think about the head coming up, this is now where our psychological element comes in, in terms of what is the youngster seeing? What is his perception of what's around him? Because for me, if he can get that ball on his outside of his right foot, i.e. the furthest foot, then he might be able to play a little ball round corners, etc. cetera. Um, the meerkat's coming again. Every time I look at Daniel, I, I go to the chat box. Um, so, guys, some great input from you. Lots of stuff in the, the tech corner. Let's just be mindful again of that psychological corner in terms of decision making, awareness, etc. Over to you, Loz. Brilliant. And it and essentially it's that hide, maneuver, and reveal. So again, you know, the boy in the blue might be hiding that ball. Um, he's going to maneuver. It could be that his body. So he might have to think about well, how am I going to maneuver my body. And the bit where he could be there revealing it to allow that red defender to potentially come in and nick it and he might then manoeuvre it again and, and spin around him. So it's really important that, you know, essentially your players are able to to replicate these these movements. And Vinny, um, how, how do you use these three terms when you're working with your kids? I just became a participant there, mate. I put my hand up. I know, I saw it. <laughs> uh, just before we moved on, I, I just, guys, I, I don't know about you, but um, my mind works very simply. Uh, and therefore, I try and put myself in the position of the youngsters. I don't know many youngsters who understand the word manoeuvre. And definitely, I don't know many who can spell it. Uh, not that footy is a spelling test. Um, so I've actually changed that. And Pete Sturgis might tell me off. But, you know, I'm happy to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him in a nice way. I've known Pete for years. Um, I, I talk, and somebody mentioned earlier, what was the, the young lad in the blue doing? Well, he was shielding the ball. So for me, the hide is shielding. Yeah. The manoeuvre is shifting so i think we can go with a shield a shift and the reveal is a show so whether people find that useful you've probably come across the hide maneuver reveal from the golden stuff that pete's done uh, but just in terms of simplicity of terminology for our children maybe the idea of shield shift keep the ball on the move and show and i'll just add one more bit once you show, it, you've got to go. OK, so if you're showing it, you can't show because otherwise the defender's going to get a foot in. Yeah, so the goal might actually be go with a bit of pace or lend the ball to a teammate. So in summary, shield, shift, show and go. So that's in my humble opinion, Loz. But I think it's important to keep the terminology simple, both for us as coaches. So then we can translate it to the young players and the older players as well. Yeah, and that, that's really important. And that's why, you know, just because these words, you know, we're saying these, it might be actually when I'm working with six-year-olds, you might have to, you know, change the terminology to suit them. When you work with older ones, it might it might change as well. But essentially, you as coaches can be creative with that. Um, so just linking into that, you know, Vinny, you, you talked about it earlier around that skill acquisition. Um, wh why do we start with the head? and Why are we working down to feet? especially at the foundation phase. Yeah, skill acquisition theory laws. I'm no expert and I wouldn't profess to be. There's people out there, academics who are far more versed in it than, than I am. Uh, but I think very simply, um, the head's the starting point because first of all, the eyes perceive. So that's where we want the children to play with the heads up uh, and the, the mere cap bit that I've mentioned. And then, you know, let's take, Let's take an eight-year-old boy or girl. Yeah, what they see isn't what we see. So um, my son Oliver, when he was eight years of age, uh, even though I'm his dad, he would be looking very much through eight-year-old eyes. So what he actually perceives is his reality. And therefore, it's important to talk about the fact that the brain is processing information. Yeah, and there's a perception and then they'll link that to action. So for those of you who are into any skill act, there's something called perception action coupling. And if you find that even remotely interesting, just Google it and you'll come across all sorts of academic stuff. But basically it's saying 
the, the eyes will perceive, the brain will process, and then we have to turn that into action. And essentially, turning that into action becomes real uh, outstanding <laughs> skill when we give the youngsters opportunity for repetition without repetition. And if I can just explain what I mean by that. We're not talking about constant practice where the youngster is simply doing stuff uh, unopposed with the ball, so dribbling around cones or turning away from cones. That's constant repetition. But if we put them into 1v1 situations, I'm looking at Brett, I've just given a big thumbs up. So Brett's saying as a rival, or a rival activity, we get the youngsters to pair off and play 1v1. Now, every 1v1, Loz, as you well know, even though the numbers are the same, every time that ball comes in, it's a different situation because the ball hasn't come in at the same angle, at the same speed, the defender isn't in the same position. So guys, that's what I mean by repetition without repetition. And it's important to have the opposition in there, either as passive or more importantly, live defenders. Brilliant. And that's really important. And, and what, what we see a lot of is, you know, kids at, at any age, as soon as they start football, we, we give them a ball and put it at their feet. Um, you know, Vinny and my background in, in PE, it's about actually, do we do a few more tag games? Are we getting them running with the ball in their hand? So they can start looking at those those words in the top right corner around, you know, are they developing their spatial awareness? I think what's really important, that their reactions and then the reflexes. So like Vinny said, the ball's going to come in at a different angle. So the reactions are going to be different every single time. So if that constant practice and that outcome's always the same, so that cone is always in the same space, that, you know, your players are just doing the same thing all the time. So when they go into a game and the defender starts moving, then they can't react because they, they haven't had that development. And that's really important that when we are working with kids, um, we do have that repetition, but there's a different outcome every single time. Um, so, so really quickly, so what does skill need? Um, what's really important is that individual development is key and linking back to what Vinny said, you know, it's about the individuals. So linking back to Brett's part around, you know, the arrival activity and allowing them to shield from each other. That's really developing the individual on the ball, but also the individual without the ball. Um, and the game starts when individual players know what they can and can't do. And then you as a coach can start recognising that. Um, Vinny, you're going to take us through a game now, aren't you? Yeah, so a couple of things, Loz. Um, first of all, guys, we've already got that mentioned. Brett, thank you for talking about what a, a good... Uh, a good activity might look like, um, perhaps as you call it a warm up, I'd call it an arrival activity. So here on the screen, we've got a really simple uh, 1v1 tag game. And just a, a few thoughts in here uh, before I, I start uh, to give a bit of, uh, of detail. You can see at the bottom there the, the four corner model, obviously not presented as a square. So first of all, into the chat box, um, why are the, uh, the various boxes different sizes? And as you're actually mulling that one over, um, this box tag game, the beauty about this is it requires four cones. So actually the children can set it up themselves. Now, I know we've got the, the COVID stuff. And to be honest, uh, you know, we've said we're not going to talk too much about COVID tonight. Um, I think with the children sanitising hands, being out in the fresh air, uh, for me, I have now moved towards the youngsters taking four cones, which have been sanitised, and setting them up and then collecting them in, because it's the same children using the same cones. So they can set this up themselves. And you can see there, we've actually got uh, a 1v1 going on, each player with a ball. So many variations on this. Uh, but for me, Loz, if you want to use it as a warm-up, then those children can actually both have ball in hand, and they can actually be moving around the area, basically trying to tag each other. So we call this, uh, or did Lars, didn't we, in the, uh, the PE world, we used to call it cat and mouse or racer chaser. So let's say that the blue player is the cat and the yellow player is the mouse. So essentially the blue player is actually trying to get around the square to actually tag the yellow player. And it might be, it is touching the ball to the body. Yeah, you could actually have touching the ball against the ball. And that's where a bit of shielding comes in. 
but this could be started with ball in hand. The really nice thing about this activity is you can manage difference. So if I'm playing against Dan, and Dan, you're a bit of a whippet, and I can't really catch you, then we can actually change the task. And Dan, as you're moving around with the ball in hand, yeah, you've got to throw and catch it at least once down every side. So you're moving around the air, but you've got to do at least one throw and catch. If you're feeling confident, you can do it twice if you want to. Yeah. So give me the opportunity. I'm still ball in hand for me to actually catch you up. And of course, we can move on to that being with ball at feet as well. So um, a really simple arrival activity that we can build and build and build through the session. Um, th there's more detail within there, guys, in terms of how to play, some rules, so many variations. Of course, we're going to share the slide deck with you. But if you haven't tried this sort of activity as an arrival, uh, it's great fun, uh, great for differentiation, uh, easy for the youngsters to set up. And of course, we are starting to work on everything we've been told about in terms of skill development. Um, the, the boxes down the bottom, Loz, has anyone chipped in with, uh, with anything in terms of why they are different sizes? Uh, no, nothing at the moment. Do you want to share your thoughts around why the boxes are in different sizes? Oh, yeah. sorry. So Dan talks about more focus on that area. Yeah. George talks about returns of the practice. Yeah. Or the, yeah. the activity. Yeah, absolutely. And if I zone in, thanks, Dan and George. Uh, Rich, Rich. talks about yeah. the physical demands. Guys, if you've ever done anything like this, yeah, then for young players, 15 seconds. 15 seconds maximum, yeah? So don't have them actually doing this for a minute, not stop, because it will go from being a fast-paced race-chase game into a very a jogging and even walking. So 15 seconds, and you could play the best of three, uh, give them a little breather in between. And again, if I'm playing Loz this time, Loz and you beat me 3-2, yeah? Or sorry, best of three, silly, 2-1. Yeah, not very good on the maths there. Then obviously you go and find a winner. And I go and find somebody who lost. Yeah, so we then start balancing it up. So a little way of actually keeping this arrival activity going for uh, seven, eight minutes as the youngsters are, are getting out the cars, etc. Um, so spot on, big emphasis on the physical corner. Uh, the technical corner you can see is, is there. Uh, the social corner less so because obviously it's a 1v1. So there's no real collaboration going on here other than the two players working sensibly and, and not having a scrap because they disagree who tagged who. Um, so, yeah, that's the, the emphasis in the four corners, Loz. Brilliant. Um, and, and just links into that building the skill. So it's about developing that connection with the ball. Um, and then these turn into individual tactics. So if me and Vinny are playing against each other, once I've developed those skills, I'm going to start applying that into a tactic. So going back to that racer-chaser game or the box tag game, it could be now that I've got quite confident with the ball. So now I'm going to start applying those tactics. So if I'm looking at Vinny and I know that he's going to turn quickly, I might actually apply a different tactic when I'm playing against him. So it's about getting the kids to understand their individual needs and how they can really apply that in, in a game. And then when they get into that 1v1, I know I've got to play a different tactic. And then if I go and play Rich next time, it might be, oh, I've got a different tactic against Rich. So it's really important that the games that we do, might, they might not start with an opposition, but really quickly get into that challenge so they can start being skillful. And we've got to prioritise those thinking skills. So I've got to really think in that game because I know that Vinny's quicker than me. So I've got to think a little bit differently. So I might change direction a, a lot more. Um, and then just linking into that, that practice design. Um, Vinny, how might you incorporate some free play into this? So you started off the... the the, the racer chaser game um how how could you get this into kind of your session now yeah can i take over control Loz, and i'll jump to my screen yeah so guys we're, we're living dangerous here yeah technology uh hopefully this works uh so i'm about to uh share my screen and then just shout up if uh if this is is working okay so what you should start to see all things being well uh can you see Loz, a yellow yeah. player on the move? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so hopefully everyone, if you keep an eye on the chat box, Loz, if uh, people say that this isn't working. Yeah. So guys, just want to show you a real practical application here. Uh, so what you can see there is the 
be the image of the picture. Uh, if I bring another blue flare across here. Okay, so why is it again so low? Why can I end up doing fine if I get caught? Because the board needs to change. Okay, got somebody's microphone on there. All right, so guys, you can should be able to see there, we've now got two examples of this going on. And of course, depending on your numbers, uh, you would actually have uh, multiple examples set up or the, the youngsters would actually set them up. Um, I've used this one here with the four cones just to show that that's uh, how simple it is to arrange. Um, it may well be that you actually have a 1v1 going on and a third player here to actually referee it in terms of who's won, who's lost, and then a little bit of rotation round. So as with everything, um, we're not going to say this works brilliantly with 12, 16 players. It works really well with whatever number you've got. So be flexible with your numbers. But essentially what I want to show you here, after you've played that race or chase the game, how can you build it? Well, of course, it all depends on what age group you're working with. But if we talk about though, that younger age, those seven, eight, nine, even 10 year olds, very, very quickly, this can actually become uh, from a 1v1. And if we take a ball out and we now take our yellows here and our blues here, and I'll get rid of that ball. Now, straight away, we've actually got the blues are now attacking that box. So without any changeover of equipment, we've turned this very, very swiftly into a 2v2. And simply now these two are protecting, whoops, sorry. These two are protecting their square. And these two are protecting their square. So obviously we can have a, a player here traveling with the ball. Just move that out of the way. Yeah, so a player here traveling with the ball. And obviously that's where our opposed play comes in in terms of our 1v1 in a bit more of a directional sense. OK, so just wanted to show you very, very simply how we could actually build our 1v1 arrival activity into a 2v2 without moving any uh, equipment at all. Uh, the other feature as well, that box is uh, not helping me there, so I'll go here, is of course you could, if I just ungroup those cones, you could actually turn these into with the equipment that you had, mini goals. So we've actually now got a couple of little goals, essentially still using the same area, and you're now actually playing your 2v2. And then finally, I'll just do one further example. You could actually have the blue player, the blue player actually sending that ball to the yellow team. And if you're working on an out of possession piece, then here's our idea of can we close down, slow down, sit down and have a showdown. And all I'm doing there is just giving you some technical detail about good defending in terms of how to press. And of course, there's our cover defender. OK, so I'll pause there, Loz. I hope that worked. Yeah, um, really. just how to make a very swift movement within real world practical session from a 1v1 tag game as an arrival into a 2v2 and obviously you could build it further if you wanted to with older age groups. Brilliant. Thanks, Vinny. I'm just going to go back to sharing. Bear with me. Okay, just as you're doing so, mate, if uh, guys, anything uh, in there that you want to either ask about or comment on, uh, just as a very simple show, because of course, um, the reality is you guys are out on the grass, maybe tomorrow evening. So anybody, any questions, uh, maybe even Loz at this point, opening up uh, a microphone or Dan, you suggested earlier, hands up. So anything on that uh, so far, maybe at this juncture, very mindful of the time. We're, we're almost yeah. on the hour, aren't we? Okay, Dan, uh, Rich, Scott, one, can you bring, oh, I think you've already answered it. Can you bring a change of direction in this game? So the 2v2. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rich, do you want to pop onto your microphone and maybe your screen and just clarify that, that question? So by change of direction, are you talking about a uh, turning skills, receiving and turning in effect? Yeah, basically, Vinny, yes. Yeah. So um, 
when your your original diagram had it in one direction but um, you're saying about managing difference or making it real to the game could you then introduce if they uh, they could turn around and turn the other way to try and to try and win that race yeah absolutely absolutely so the um you know the the one v one stuff that there's a lot of agility in there in terms of the uh, the race and chaser particularly the uh, the, the the mouse, if you like, if we're going with the cat and mouse analogy, the mouse is obviously trying to uh, change direction and avoid avoid the cat. So um, just on that, Rich, it's back on the screen there. So this one here, if the yellow player here is the, the mouse, they don't have to keep moving. This isn't about just moving round in, let's say, an anti-clockwise direction. Yeah. Right. If the blue player is catching the yellow player, and this is where going back to skill being perception, the only way that yellow player will know is if he or she has got the head up. Yeah. And if the blue player is actually getting closer, 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 then obviously that player might decide to slow down and then speed up again. Yeah. The cat might think, do you know what? I'm not catching. I'm not catching. I'm not catching. I'm going to change direction. And I'm actually going to see if I can fool this player because I think they've got the head down, particularly when it's ball of feet. So this one isn't a round and round the garden thing. Right. This is a change direction when you want to. And just one last one, Rich. Um, imagine there's four cones here on the corner. In terms of a real challenge, turn one of the cones upside down. And actually, only the cat knows that when he or she gets to the upside down cone, can they cut across. Right, okay. And that's, yeah. that's hours of fun, yeah? Because <laughs> the yellow player now ends up in another field. So you now actually says, yeah, no, stay around your area. How can you now still dodge away from that defender who's cut across? Okay, so it's a really simple trick. Uh, the simplest of things, either have a different coloured cone or turn one upside down, and that's a trigger. Eventually, this player will work out that that's the trigger, so they'll, they'll be watching out for it. But again, that's where the meerkat thing comes in. He or she will only know that this player is getting close to that chance to cut across if they've got the head up. Is that okay? Um, yeah, just to quickly, so Mark, yeah, only the, the cat, no, only the mouse can change direction. So the defender is chasing, it's the attacker is, is the one that changes direction. So if me and Vinny were playing against each other, we, and I'm the defender, I would be looking at Vinny's trigger to go actually if he changes direction I might need to change direction as well so hopefully that makes sense yeah it's not a, it's not a case of um, guys we prefer to do this obviously live on the grass uh, you get you de need to designate who's doing what so this isn't a can each of them catch each other this is one is the chaser one is the racer one is the cat one is the mouse and therefore it's it's very much an awareness piece Okay, have a go, see how it goes. Remember, if it fails, it isn't a fail. It's a first attempt in learning for us as coaches. First attempt in learning. Cool. Okay. Um, and just to kind of wrap us up tonight, um, you know, can you view possession as an individual event in foundation phase? Um, if you can, then together we can help players master the ball, more importantly, their bodies, and then the decisions that they make. So essentially everything is about that individual child and that individual event. Um, just to quote there, Vinny, I know, I know you like this slide. Um, do you want to take this one? Yeah, absolutely, mate. It's um, obviously Pete, who we, we all admire in terms of what he's done uh, in his, his many years in the game, but not least the um, our opportunity to give our children the best possible experience. That's what it's all about, isn't it? So that the children uh, want to come back every week. Uh, they want to keep improving. They want to keep striving. And that's where Pete's talking about there. It's our opportunity to influence the child's attitude to sport and to learning. Uh, and the bit I've just said there, guys, uh, specifically to Rich in terms of trying things out, when the children fail, remember, that's just part of the learning. So if you can take that word with you, fail, first attempt in learning. As they get a bit older, just change it slightly. It's a further attempt in learning. 
And I think we learn most when we actually make mistakes. So allow the children those opportunities to try things out. Practice sessions is the easy bit, I would say. It's on match days when they get things wrong. And that's where our behaviours have got to be consistent and have got to be kind because the children will make mistakes. Brilliant. And then just to finalise, so after this, you know, after tonight, you know, can you change one or two things um, that you might not do and, and continue doing um, and try? And then can you make that foundation phase experience really memorable? So, you know, when they get older, can they think, oh, it was Mark that coached me and he taught me this game and I love that game that we do. Or um, Rich on there, or we, we did Racer Chaser and when they come back next week, they, they ask to do that game again. So it's really memorable. You know, even better, you know, when they go to school, are they trying the games that you do with them? So it's that extension of learning that it's not just in that hour that they're with you at practice, um, that they, you know, they're doing it in the back gardens with their brothers and sisters. So that's really important as well. Um, just in terms of next steps, like we said, try some, share some of the, the ideas. So this is recorded. So, you know, once we get the link from Dan and, and George, you know, feel free to share it to your your colleagues, your your coaches that you're working with, even the parents. So, you know, if you are going to go down this master in the ball, 1v1, you know, terminology, you know, send it to the parents and, you know, maybe they want to watch it as well. Let us know your success stories. So if you are trying these games, please let us know either through the County FA or, or contact us directly. Um, and then just some further links. So we've got the boot room, the coaching community and the FA learning um, YouTube channel. So really important, some, some extra learning for you to go and do. And then, like I said, if you want to know more information, feel free to contact me, Vinny, Martin, who's not on, on tonight, and our details are there. So, again, any help around women and girls, PE, so if there's any teachers on here, contact Vinny. Um, and then anything around the DNI space. And then, just to finalise, uh, Dan and, and George are on, on the call tonight as well. Um, anything like more local uh, through the County FA, feel free to contact them. Uh, final words. Vinny, anything to add? Yeah, if you can go back one slide for us, Loz, just in terms of the uh, our grassroots team. Uh, and in fact, it must I think it's our earlier slide, isn't it? Our earlier slide, guys, has got our Twitter handle on. Um, so I think for me, um, all the things we've talked about tonight, you know, there's, as I can see with you guys on the screen, there's loads of experience here. We want to hear how you get on. Let's stay connected. Uh, now that we are moving uh, touch wood continuously beyond COVID, we can be more uh, regularly now back out on the grass. So please try things. Uh, feel free to link in with myself and Loz on Twitter. Um, I'm um, regularly sharing things that I've tried out in the grassroots space. So forget this badge, which I'm privileged to wear. Actually, just like you as a grassroots coach, trying things out. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And so I think it's important just to keep sharing what you've tried, what's worked. Because for me, every day is a school day and I'll learn stuff from you guys as well. And that's the privilege of having the job that I've got. So um, great engagement tonight from everyone. Uh, obviously, thanks for uh, to Dan and George for hosting things and to you, Loz, for, for comparing brilliantly. And uh, yeah, it's been really enjoyable. And as usual, uh, we're happy to stay on for a few minutes. If people have got some individual questions, uh, though we're mindful that it's, uh, it's from the evening.